America has always prided itself in being the land of opportunity, a nation where the qualities of good skills, hard work, perseverance, and playing by generally accepted rules have been essential elements in achieving the American dream. For generations, many millions of Americans were able to realize their versions of that dream. But is that still true today? And will it be true for generations to come? Much of the last century was focused around the Industrial Revolution. Millions and millions of Americans were developing the knowledge, the skills uh, that we call human capital. And the human capital that people developed was exactly the right set of knowledges and skills they needed. And so a high school education, high school level skills, pretty much guaranteed you a place in the middle class. And there was a very high level of economic dynamism and change which created the opportunities. And all that meant that everybody had a chance to really make the American dream, and millions did. Now, millions did not. They were shut out either by racial discrimination or because they lived in you know, extremely poor areas. But for large numbers of Americans, the American dream was a reality. You had really robust economic growth, shrinking income inequality. In many ways, you know, it was a golden age of egalitarianism. In that post-World War II era, wherever you were uh, on the economic ladder, you had social capital. Well, they had the family bonds, the social networks, whether it was through the unions or through fraternal clubs, through neighborhoods, and also those shared norms and behaviors that everybody respected and honored. Everything seemed to come together in a way to enable us to advance together as a, as a nation. All that led to uh, an enormous increase in prosperity uh, and the largest increase in the middle class that not only that this country had ever seen, but that the world had ever seen. And everybody sort of expected that this would go on forever, but it didn't. Equal opportunity is a core value of our country. And it's on the basis of that equal opportunity that we then want folks to compete. And for talent and hard work and all of those, and you know, of the American ethos to pay off in the achievement of the American dream. We see that human capital and social capital together are the basis of achieving adult outcomes. And because of that, we define opportunity as those pathways that allow children to develop and accumulate the human capital and the social capital they'll need for their adult lives. But in the mid-70s and beyond, there was a shift away from the machines as being the most important kind of capital to human capital being the most important form of capital. As we've shifted from a manufacturing economy towards a knowledge-based economy, the educational premium has gone way up, and people who used to make a good living through unionized jobs, through skilled jobs, through manufacturing jobs, they found themselves going down. Nowadays, the Western middle class worker is competing with a global labor force, and that is exerting real downward pressure on wages. I can't impact the fact that U.S. Steel decided to take much of their business and many related industries outside of the country. Today, we are defined by technology, by knowledge-based jobs. The reality is when it comes to a lot of middle-class jobs, they're simply disappearing. The jobs, they're gone. It used to be graphic packaging, that parking lot used to be full. Georgia Pacific, beach product, all of this is gone, man. There's been this skills bias polarization. So if you have the skills in education today to take advantage of the IT revolution, you're gonna be fine. But if you don't have that education, you're in real trouble. And so for that group of people, the chances of them ever participating meaningfully in American life is almost non-existent. 
we are stuck in an economy that is suffering from an absence of a strategic plan to create opportunity. What we will see is a slow but inexorable polarization of our society into a relatively small group of haves and a relatively large group of have-nots that will place enormous strain on the nature of American society and democracy. What you see is this pulling apart or this bifurcation of the society uh, along the lines of uh, education and human capital. There was a profound change in the kinds of human capital that were valued. And those individuals who had that human capital, they were doing well. And their communities do well. So they're able to maintain not only their human capital, but their social capital as well. It's become more and more of a two-tiered economy with a small number of people at the top and everybody else kind of struggling to stay where they are or falling down. What we have in Detroit are people who want good things. Many of them believe in the American dream, even though the American dream has not proven to be a reality for them. The worst is the working middle class. You've worked hard, you've paid your taxes, you put your kids through school, and you're still going downhill. What's interesting when you think about it through the lens of opportunity, the relationship between human capital and social capital has changed. So we are becoming more polarized as a society, not just in terms of our skills, but also in terms of our social capital. So even as the economic divide has been growing larger, so has the social and cultural one. You've seen a polarization of the residential structure of the United States. So you see affluent places becoming increasingly affluent and poor places becoming increasingly poor. Where neighborhoods used to be this mix of people with different levels of education on economic lines. This was a mixed neighborhood growing up. It was actually one of the best sides. West was always considered one of the affluent sides. You know, there's a different mindset here now. There's really no blue collar here now. There's poor people who live in now, so there's a concentration of poverty. The neighborhoods and communities began to fracture, and with that fracturing, the social capital began to dissipate. And the people who live in that community no longer have the trust, the bonds that sustain them and the community as a whole. When you go down east, when you go to towns and villages all over the state of Maine, there is no opportunity. People are trapped. 40 years ago, um, these communities had a greater sense of self-sufficiency. There were smaller mills, canning factories. Um, there was a way of life, and I have seen that almost entirely go away. So people really wonder where to look for hope. Gary had the best park system. Gary had the best educational system. There have been so many outside forces that have had an adverse impact on the resiliency of the community, on the spirit of the community. Most of the towns uh, turn it into ghost towns because there's just not enough people to keep them viable. For decades, Silicon Valley was actually a middle-class town. This has changed. Our face today is one of extremely high income earners and then an impoverished class. And now people are lucky enough to hold on if they can because there's so much influx of wealth coming in and displacing people. Our youth now, most of them don't come back because there are no jobs for them to come back to. The lack of employment is, is incredible here. The co-industry leaving lost thousands of jobs. You know, when you think of thousands of jobs, you can multiply that by four or five because you've got that many people in that family that it impacted. There are legions of studies that prove what we all know to be true, and that is that the thing that makes the greatest difference in the life of a child are caring adults who are healthy in their own right. And when you reach a point where there are too few of those adults in a community, that it has disastrous consequences for all the kids in that community. On the one hand, students from affluent families and backgrounds enjoy high quality public education. But students who live in concentrated poverty often have educational experiences which are less than optimal, in fact, which are dreadful. The concern that we all share is that education in our society is the gateway to opportunity.
My name is Tierra and I want to be a neurosurgeon when I grow up. When I grow up, I want to be a physician. I want to be a baseball star. When I grow up, I want to be a scientist. Hi, I am... Well, you listen to these kids and, and you, you look at them and you listen to their, their hopes and dreams. You have to wonder, are they really going to make it? My name is Jordan and I'm 10 years old and I want to be a game designer when I grow up. It's important for us to recognize that these kids are growing up. In, in the circumstances that reflect the shifts that have taken place in America over the last 30 to 40 years. So in order for these kids to realize their hopes and dreams, they have to have opportunity. And by opportunity, we mean pathways have to be clear for them to be able to develop the human and social capital that they're gonna need in order to participate fully in American life. As these children grow and develop, what will their opportunity pathways look like? For children born into families with rich human and social capital, advantages start before birth and continue to accumulate over their life trajectories. We now know that even by age four or five, children from higher income, better educated families have a lot more human capital than those from less educated or less fortunate families. Some of the changes that are happening in the world today uh, make what schools like ours are doing and much more of an emphasis on teaching and learning even more relevant. We know that we want kids using technology here because that's the world they live in. For those born into families with poor human and social capital, the disadvantages can also start before birth and begin to accumulate. In any part of the United States, there's not an equal playing field for all kids when they come into a school. Who protects them from the larger problem? The violence in the neighborhood, the drug dealing, the insensitivity, the guns, the guns, the guns. What happens to the child? At seven, I've seen them already with the lights out. So I keep coming back to this idea of a door. For some kids, that door is not only not open, but it's virtually locked and they've got to be a hero to get through it. About 70% of these children uh, live below in the poverty line. They need more than just an in-school education, after-school education, sports. I think of the children that we work with who live in poverty, uh, many of them don't know where the next meal is coming from. They live in houses that are not safe. What we see in the children is hopelessness. We just finished a round of our own research with involved 2,000 students across the state. And the surprising thing in California is that actually a half of students can't name a single caring adult. Be that your family members, be that a teacher or a principal or a counselor. So add the income inequality to these inequalities in the circumstances of a child's birth and the stability of their early environments, add that to the educational inequalities, uh, all the way from K through 12 through uh, college, and you've got a recipe for less social mobility in the future. The opportunity to develop the kinds of human and social capital they need is, is basically denied. They find too many gates, too many pathways that are blocked. This uh, breakup of communities, the lack of relevant human capital, the loss of the social capital, it affects the adults and therefore changes the lives of the children. And the consequence of that has been a recession in opportunity, a dramatic recession in social mobility, uh, and and, and those feed upon themselves, and it becomes a, a vicious cycle. These are self-sustaining forces. This is not something that's going to stop and go away, and we're going to return to the way we were. And what we'll see is an accumulation of advantage and an accumulation of disadvantage that will play out from generation to generation. So as we confront the effects of these forces that are driving us apart, denying opportunity to millions of children, is there still hope? When we drive across America, we can readily see the divisions that have occurred over the last 40 years. But we also see something else, 
We know that all over this country there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, of people and organizations that really get it. They understand the importance of human social capital. They may not use those words, but nonetheless, they are providing their neighborhoods, their communities, with the skills, the links, the trust that they will need to succeed in the 21st century. In rural Washington County, Maine, the EDGE program helps develop both human and social capital in young people whose families have very limited resources. Uh, all the research pointed to the need to surround children with family, community, and a positive school environment and their peers. And that's what we're trying to do up here. It requires an informed, well-informed understanding of how to reach into families without disrupting them and solve the aspiration challenge. Because we know that children either recognize and develop aspiration and see opportunity and possibility, or don't. In Kalamazoo, Michigan, a group of anonymous donors created the Kalamazoo Promise, a program that pays for a college education for all graduates from the city's public high schools. One of the donors said, you know, if we paid for everybody to go to college, that's what would make the difference in our community. The community was really mobilized because of the promise. People were saying things like, well, if other people can give lots of money to send complete strangers to college, the least I can do is volunteer to help a kid read better. An investment in human capital, this great, is one that will pay dividends in this community and far beyond this community for many, many years to go. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, one of the hardest hit of the Rust Belt cities, has reinvented itself, transitioning dramatically into the new economy. The president of Carnegie Mellon University, Dr. Sirent, said the universities could be the economic drivers of this region. Now, we thought of the universities as places you go to get educated and maybe do research, but not like our steel mills. Uh, and so for, that was a revolutionary idea. And as a community, we began to think about what it meant to have the universities to be the economic drivers and how do we build an entrepreneurial culture. Fast forward to today, uh, we have one of the, the best economies in the country here. Literally everywhere we looked, there were people coming to grips with this problem and creating opportunity for our nation's children. That's good. That means that you're rolling, okay? And what we need now is to go beyond those individual points of light to a nationwide network of individuals, organizations, and even governments that will see the problem, work together, provide each other with support and inspiration. And we at ETS want to learn from them, support them in any way that we can to help us as a nation create opportunity for all our children. Why do you want to be a teacher? Um, I like teaching because starting kids young, um, I want to let them know that they can make it anywhere. And knowing that helps me every day. You know, I mean, I was a part of that whole opportunity wave. Um, but we, we, we created the institutions that opened those opportunities. I think we can change the circumstances that are now closing those opportunities. There is no magic bullet. There is no one thing we can do as a society. We have to be in this for the long haul. We need to be systematic about it. America does great things. We've done great things throughout our history. And I think it's time for us to come together uh, as a country um, and recognize the importance of the challenges we face to who we are as a society and who we want to be 25 years from now. This is a tremendous opportunity to figure it out and to get it right and then to spread that across the country. And can you imagine like what's available for us as a country if we get that right? You know, we're at this crossroads and the path that we choose will have major implications, I think, for what we look like as a society in, a, in, a, in the next generation. My name is Diana Faithful. I am 10 years old and when I grow up I want to be a singer. Hi, my name is Caleb Jones and my hobby is photography and I want to own my own production film when I get older. My name is Kayla. I'm nine years old. I like to draw and I want to be a fashion designer when I grow up. When I grow up, I want to be an animal rescuer because I love animals. When I grow up, I want to be some kind of scientist. I'm not sure right 
quite yet, but there is a, because there's so many keys. My name is Desiree Grant. I'm from Columbia, Maine, and I'm going to be a freshman at the University of Maine at Machias. People set good examples for me, and I learn from that. Many people would say that people who live in Washington County, especially growing up in a trailer, don't have opportunities. I am a big dreamer, so all I thought was I want to get out and I want to be something big. 